Karen Payne. Is there any other immediate? Our people just passed on our rolls. Of Area 33? Yes. So our, uh, another past <laughs> Area 33 <laughs> governor, Harvey Dove. We'll get our turn. Wonderful. A few guidelines as we begin our contest today. First, no flash cameras, no video cameras unless previously arranged with our contestants. Turn off pagers. We have pagers nowadays? Beepers, phones, or anything else that will distract our contestants. Please keep aisles clear from debris such as briefcases, purses, etc. The sergeant at arms is instructed to not allow anyone to enter or leave during a speech. You may leave in between. And our sergeant of arms is Michael. Our other one is Chris. Chris, you're manning that door. Michael, you're manning that door. Here are the rules for the speech evaluation contest. We begin our contest with a five to seven minute speech. After the test speech, contestants are escorted out of the room and they spend five minutes preparing notes for the evaluation. After five minutes, the sergeant in arms collects the notes of each contestant, except for those of contestant number one. Contestant number one is escorted back into the room and is introduced by the Toastmaster. Notes of subsequent contestants are returned just before each, each member comes back into the room. After finishing their evaluation, contestants may remain in the room during the duration of the contest. Evaluations are two to three minutes in length. Minimum time is one and a half minutes. Maximum time is three and a half minutes. You will have the green light. Can we have that shown, please? Green card in this case. So notice where your timer is at. Green card at two minutes. Yellow, yellow card at two and a half minutes. Red card at three minutes, and you'll have 30 seconds to wrap up. That red card will remain displayed. There is a one minute of silence between contestants for judges to complete their tallies. After the final contestant, the audience will, will be requested to remain quiet until all judges have completed their ballots. When all the ballots are collected, the chief judge will announce, Mr. Toastmaster, all ballots have been collected. Now, everyone should have a program in front of them. Raise your hand if you don't. Great. We'll go over order of contestants. First is our speech evaluation. First will be Daryl Garcia. Second, Amy Hill. <coughs> Third, Alice Daniel. <coughs> Fourth, Nicole Dunn. Fifth, Andrea Weichel. Again, first is Daryl Garcia. Second is Amy Hill. Third is Alice Daniel. Fourth is Nicole Dunn. And fifth is Andrea Weichel. To the audience, the rules have been reviewed with the chief judge and contestants. The contestants have been informed of the location of the timing lights. Let us proceed with our first, with our speech evaluation contest. Please help me welcome Chet Robinson with his speech entitled, S equals T times E. S equals T times E, Chet Robinson. Spring 2013 was a great time for baseball in Petroglyph Little League. My son Harris was having a phenomenal season. He was hitting, he was throwing, he was dominating. <coughs> Which is an eight-year-old can dominate machine pitch Little League, I guess. The team was also doing very well. And I know this because it was a non-competitive league, and so the parents naturally kept score religiously. We weren't supposed to, but we did. And we knew that we were winning every game by 10 to 15 runs. It was fantastic. Although it was non-competitive, the league decided to put a competitive contest at the end of the season as a tournament. And because we'd done so well, even though it was unofficial, we got automatically advanced to the semifinals. Now this was our first chance as a team to compete in a game where it mattered. And I'll tell you, I think the nerves got to the boys. My son included. His first two at bats, he struck out. Now he'd struck out a little bit during the season, but never twice in a row. Holy cow, I thought the nerves were getting to him. Had I not prepared him as a father? This was his first time he could fail, and I don't know if he was ready for it. Well, the team did their job. 
And as the game progressed, we went up, we went down, we got to the very final inning and we were down by a run. One run. Now the bases were loaded, the team had done their job, the bats were going, bases were loaded and there were two outs. And guess who was up? Our young hero, Harris, my little boy. Now I'm playing first base coach, so I've got a front row seat to the action. From what I sh am sure is going to be a sports movie moment. He's gonna hit the ball, two people will run in, then the team will pick him up and carry him off and pour Gatorade on him, right? Then we're gonna get this fist pump, freeze frame, to credits. It's gonna be great, this is gonna be a Disney movie, I know what's gonna happen. So Harris walks out of the dugout, past me on first base, nods at me, you know, like little boys do. A lot, a lot of arrogance there, I like it, right? And I say, hey, Harris, you know what to do. Go get it. He goes, to, he goes to home plate. It's machine pitch. So the machine pitches the ball to the kid. And it comes out, and Harris takes a big swing. It hits the catcher's glove. Strike one. Harris, no big deal. You got seven pitches with three strikes. Don't worry about it. You got this. OK, Dad. Gets back up. Takes a golf swing this time as it comes in. Strike two. Now I'm a little nervous. Is my Disney movie gonna play out or not? <laughs> so I say, Harris, listen, you got seven pitches to worry about. Go ahead and let the next two go, watch them to see what happens with the ball. Okay, Dad, pitch three, pitch four. Just like I told him to, he did the right thing. Now he knows where the ball is at. You know where it is, son? I do, Dad, hit the ball. I'm nervous, he just has to hit the ball. So the machine pitches it to my son. He takes a big swing and crack right over my head. Out of bounds, it's a foul. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Okay, pitch six. You got it, Harris, you got it. Crack again, straight up. Behind him, foul ball again. We're to the seventh pitch. He has to swing. This is it. This is my movie moment, I'm so excited. The pitch comes out. It comes out a little wonky. It goes high and it goes wide, but Harris sees it. I've trained him for this. He jumps. And he swings, and he misses. <laughs> the season is over, the tournament is over, he lost. I don't know how many of your parents, or how many of you have been in this scenario, but I will tell you this. The look on my little boy's face broke my heart. For the first time in his life, he had tried and failed. Fellow Toastmasters honored guests, I'll ask you the same question. Have you ever tried and failed? I have. It sucks. It is no fun. It's the sort of pain that makes you question why in the world did you even try in the first place? And it really makes you question if you're ever going to try again. Do I ever want to do this again? Do I want this kind of pain? Harris and I shared a lot of tears that day. I'm not going to lie. We really did. As we came to grips with the reality of that game, he asked me a question that absolutely floored me. It rocked me to my core. He said, Dad, can we go to the batting cage? Right now. Right now. He taught his old man an important lesson that day. That when you fail, you use it as motivation. You learn. And then you go try again. There's no guarantee you'll succeed. There's no guarantee at all. But you try again. Trying is hard. Quitting is easy. <coughs> he taught me a lesson. We'll return to our young hero in just a moment. Personally and professionally, I've always believed that success can be quantified by a simple equation. S equals T multiplied by E, where success equals time multiplied by effort. Meaning, if you're not achieving the success you want, it's because you're probably not giving it the kind of effort it needs. And or, you haven't been giving it that kind of effort for long enough. I'll give you a personal example. I decided recently that I wanted to lose some weight. Yeah, right, who's been there? I wanted to lose some weight. And so I decided I was going to run three miles every day on the elliptical. Three miles. I could do it. I don't care if it took me an hour or three hours. I was going to do it. So I tried the heck out of it. I did it for a week. And then I hopped on the scale. I wanted to see my amazing results, right? My E was perfect. My effort was right there. I knew what I needed to do. And I had lost a half a pound. I've been busting my hump for a week and I lost a half a pound. What's wrong? Let me look at the equation. Success, I know what I wanted to do. I wanted to lose about 10 pounds. Equals T times E. Oh crap, my T was off. I had been doing the right thing, but I hadn't been doing it for long enough. Now I will tell you this equation is universally applicable. Anything you want to do can be quantified this way, but there's a catch. If 
wherever you are in your life, you don't have enough T or E to dedicate to the equation, you will fail. And it's going to suck. So why in the world would we even try? I'll tell you we try because sometimes, sometimes the equation's right and it works. Let's revisit our young hero exactly a year later in spring of this year. Terrace number nine. I am the ball. That's me. I am the ball. You got it. <coughs> Sergeant of Arms, please escort our evaluation contestants outside the room, please. Let me know when you're ready and we'll start the timer for five minutes. Please start the timer for five minutes. You'll see how long five minutes, but to them five minutes goes real quick. As we're eating, I want to take a moment just to welcome you and some of our teammates here at HP. I want to acknowledge a few people. So raise your hand if you're with Rio Rancho Toastmasters. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wow. So this is a story. <laughs> we have a banner. Here's HP's banner. Here's Rio Rancho's banner. In a very organized, stealth manner, HP Rio Rancho had five members go on a Monday night during their meeting and attend. Unbeknownst to them, we took their banner. <laughs> you were very hospitable, and we welcome you to reclaim, as I see, you have over five. So at the end of our meeting today, we'll be able to re return that banner to you. So give your hand. <laughs> Raise your hand if you are with midday Rio Rancho Toastmasters. One, two, three, four, five. All right. That is impressive. Why is that impressive? How many members do you currently have? Ten. Ten. That's 50%. <laughs> Wonderful. What time do you meet? We meet at uh, 1130 to 1230 on Wednesdays. On Wednesdays. Public clubs. So HP used to be a closed corporate club. Now that we're open, our hopes are to, within this area, be able to have outside HP employees as members of HP Rewatch Toastmasters. As far as announcements, this is a good time for it because I think we have about two more minutes. Is by chance. <laughs> is there anyone from Taylor Ranch today? Oh, you're a good girl. That's right. Give me a hand. Taylor Ranch is quit over in Taylor Ranch Community Center. You meet on thir Tuesdays. Tuesday evening at uh, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. You were our first banner raid. That was over five weeks ago. We appreciate the patience. <laughs> we have one, but our hopes today is actually to return this banner to you, just because that gap is so hard to close. We had some communications, so we'll be able to get that ready for you. 
Rio Rancho or Midday? What do you guys think so far of the contest? That was a pretty good speech oh, okay. evaluation. Yeah. Yeah. We're only halfway there, so five minutes is a long time. So HP, we are actually Toastmaster, was founded just over three months ago. Harvey Dove and Doug Mayton were our club sponsors. What that meant was they were familiar with Toastmasters. We didn't have any clue what Toastmasters was all about until Yen said, you know what, maybe, which is our young employee network here internally with HP, said we need something to help our HP employees with communication skills, with leadership skills. And I tell you, I've been with Toastmasters for three years, and for the first time, I got stumped in a training lift in the last 24 hours. <laughs> I got hit to a wall on a cold calling session from hell. Now, raise your hand if, if you're influenced with East Coast people. Yes? I, I, I say that because in sales, you have to know your audience. I'm a West Coast individual. I'm used to surfing. I moved to New Mexico, most of you know. There's a lot of beach out here, no ocean. I learned how to adapt, and people in New Mexico speak differently, that's all there is to it. I sold in California. My territory is Dallas, Texas. Is Texas a little bit different than the rest of the United States? So when I faced this individual from East Coast, he led me on a journey I'll never forget. And I realized one thing during that training, that one, Practice makes perfect. Postmasters gives me an opportunity to practice a skill that is directly related to what I do on my job here at HP. Sometimes talking to technical talk is a little bit different than just worldly things and intellectual things that we have. But that's a challenge that I am putting on myself for the next year is to really fuse the concept of what I do at work and how Postmasters can help me. Time again? 20 seconds left. 20 seconds left. All right, as we prepare, if you need to get a water real quick, we can do that, but we're going to get ready to start to our next, yes, Harvey. With the exception of Doug Maiden, I think Taylor Ranch is a bunch of whips. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't clap, sorry. <laughs> All right, Sergeant at Arms, our time has been reached, please. Bring in contestant number one. <clears throat> Please collect all notes from each contestant. All notes collected. Notes are collected. There's a technical difficulty real quick. We're going to get that situated. HP and technology. We use laptops sometimes to take notes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> First contestant? Yeah. First contestant, Daryl Garcia. Give him a hand. I've had the privilege of hearing Chet speak numerous times. And this speech was really interesting to me because it was about a couple of things. The first thing is it was about children. Now, for someone like myself, I don't have any children at all. But I feel that Chet made the speech very relatable to people that don't have children. Now, there was a lot of visualizations I think you did a really good job of, especially with the baseball bat. I could hear the sounds. I could see the expressions on your face. I could picture Harris walking up to the plate. I, I could see the, the funny gestures. I thought it was a really nice touch that in this, in this drama that you added a lot of humor, which I think is always a really, a really great way to deliver a speech. Now, besides just the child aspect, you also related it to losing weight, which is something that we all can relate to and we've all struggled with. So I thought that was a really nice touch to a struggle within this speech as well. Now, I really like the analogy that you used for failure, that you had it down to a recipe, that being success equaling time and effort. I felt that that really painted a picture in my mind 
of what success actually was. And even in some parts of this speech, it even brought me back to personal failures in my life and what I could have done better or what I even learned from that situation and how it fit into this mold of what you consider to be success. Now, I felt that there was great use of drama. There was a lot of buildup. Where I got a little lost is it was a little fast paced. There was a lot of great story. I felt that the drama could have been a little slower paced just to build up my anticipation. Before I was anticipating something, it was already on to the next part. So I felt that maybe pausing and giving me a second to really anticipate what is coming next would really add a lot to the speech. Now, I thought there was a few times where I mentioned Harris was in there. Now, you did a great job with the facial expressions, but I felt that when he was referenced, you maybe could have done a better job at, at doing the, the voice that Harris has. Instead of just answering in, in your normal tone, maybe add more of a, of a childish type tone or something along the lines of that. Aside from that, I thought it was, like I said, it was really relatable. I really enjoyed it. I didn't really count a lot of incorrect sentences, speeches, any improper grammar or anything like that. And I think you did a great job. Timer, please allow one minute of silence. Sergeant Arms, please turn the notes to contestant number two, Amy Hill. Amy Hill. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Welcome, fellow Toastmasters and honored guests. It's a pleasure to, to evaluate Chet's speech about success equals times, time times effort, which equals never try, never, never stop trying. I remember Chet's opening because he began with a, a story about a child, and at first I'm thinking, what does this have to do with us as adults? And he was very easily, he very easily brought that into what it can do for us as adults. <coughs> He took that story and, and taught us that trying is hard, quitting is easy. Where a lot of us, myself included, I did not want to get up here and do this speech today, evaluation today, but I'm trying and I'm going to get better. Chet, your speech gave me that know-how to continue. <coughs> I liked your use of language throughout your speech, Universal, universally applicable was one of the phrases that you used that stood out to me. Even throughout your speech, you used several transitions and words that I thought were great use of language. And then you ended strongly by sharing a video that not only you had told the story, put it into a context that allowed us to apply it to ourselves, but then wrapped it up with never give up. And you showed us the video on what happens when you never give up. <coughs> Couple of recommendations. Take a deep breath and slow down. I noticed at the very beginning you jumped in and you were talking very fast. <coughs> Probably trying to get it in under your time limit. I'm notorious for that as well. But slow down a little bit. It was kind of hard to understand in the first few sentences. You eventually did. <coughs> and maybe a little more animation. I saw you swinging the bat um, a couple of different times. but. Your pacing 
back and forth between the podium or between the screens. It was not um, intentional. It seemed to be more nervous. Okay. <coughs> but even without those couple of it, uh, areas for correction, I thought your speech was fantastic. <coughs> you taught me again never to stop trying. Thank you. Please allow another minute of silence. Contestant number three, Alice Daniel. <coughs> Alice Daniel. Fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, Chet, you are a wonderful speaker. We love to listen to you here at HP Rio Rancho Toastmasters. The speech you gave today was very motivational. But not only that, it was relatable and entertaining to the audience, and that's important. You started with a story, a personal story, that built the tension and gave the audience some moments of humor that allowed them to connect with you. That was excellent, an excellent way to start your speech. And then you made your point. And what an excellent point. Success equals, times, equals time multiplied by effort. All of us could certainly benefit from that attitude. Finally, you solidified that point with a very relatable example. Who hasn't, at some point or the other, thought I could lose a little weight or gain a little muscle or change something about my body? Everyone in here probably can relate to that example you gave. So really, the structure of your speech built into how motivational and how much we could take from that. I loved it. Throughout the speech, you really used your sound effects, your body movement, to emphasize words and emphasize points you were making. One thing I think you could have done a little bit more of was modify the pitch and the tone of your voice. There were some moments that I think a little louder or a little softer backing off would have maybe helped increase that tension that you were building throughout the story you opened with. So that's something I think that a little more practice of that speech would certainly help with. Overall, though, the story you told, the way you wrapped the story into the message you were trying to get across to the audience, the way you made it relatable, the way you brought your personal experiences into the speech you gave, really allowed us to take that message and think about how it's true and applicable to our own lives. So thank you for giving a great speech today, Chet. We really appreciate it. Please allow one minute for silence.
Put your arms. Please return the notes to contestant number four. Nicole Dunn. Toastmasters honored guests. Chet, today you spoke for us with the, I believe it was S equals T times E. Especially when we have someone who is a, as accomplished and talented of a speaker as Chet is, it is especially important to find room for growth. It requires us to scrupulously find room for improvement. That being said, do not hold it against me for being a little picky. <laughs> I felt that you started your speech a little soon. Some of us were still kind of clapping, welcoming you to the stage. Take a moment when you get here, take a breath, acclimate to the stage. This may have had an effect on your pace. I noticed that you spoke a little faster today than you usually do. Chet, you have always been a great storyteller. You have an ability to tell us a story as if you've told it a hundred times. You always sound prepared, even when it comes to table topics. One thing to take into mind, though, is the form of the story. Today, I felt your story was a little relaxed for the audience. It may have... Uh, been because of certain word usage, and those particularly would be the use of the word suck and sucks, and I also heard a crap in there, <laughs> which in our normal meetings would be completely fine, but this one's a little more formal, so it might have been a time to, to bring that informality back a little bit. I noticed today that you're, as I was speaking about your pace, you also could have left some time in your pacing for more pausing. Some of our laughs were caught a little short. I'd say you were probably on point about 60% of the time with the pausing, so not bad. Could have left a little more time for us to laugh at how you know hilarious your, your points were. <laughs> there were some other verbiage that was just a little lax, but not bad. Uh, one time you were talking about your son, you said, I tell you, I think, and we did point out to you one time about the nose touching. It's small, but you're so good, we've got to point out the small things. <laughs> Again, Chet, I really appreciate you giving us the speech today, and I really loved the tagline and what you kind of taught us today with the success equals time multiplied by effort. Because that is, that's very true, and I think that's a good example for us to all take. Sometimes we do feel that we're putting in all the work so should we should get the results. But it does take time for that effort to equal success. Thank you, Chet. Timer, please allow one minute of silence. Please return the notes to our fifth contestant, Andrea Weichel. Thank you, Mr. Postmaster. Hello. Welcome guests and fellow Toastmasters. Chet, you really make it so hard for all of us <laughs> to evaluate you. You're such an entertaining and exciting speaker. 
You always make great eye contact with each and every individual using wonderful volume of your voice. Nobody ever has any trouble hearing you at all. You speak clearly and effectively. You don't use ums or ahs as filler words. You have correct grammar. What's an evaluator to do? I love the way you jumped into the beginning of your speech and engaged us right away. One thing I did find that I, I would maybe ask you to think about is slowing down your pace sometimes. I felt like you did that effectively towards the end and there was a little bit more pacing, a little bit more volume up and volume down. Whereas for kind of the first part of it, I felt that it was a little fast. You spoke a little fast. So that it was sometimes a little hard to keep up. But that was, I think, just an example of how your enthusiasm was contagious to the rest of the audience. We were right there with you, with your boy, at the baseball game, always trying to hit that ball. And let's talk about body language. That was wonderful. I love the way you used body language to really put us there in that ballpark with you and your boy and your wife. So we were right there with you the whole time. I love the way you used the stage, especially towards the end where you stopped and paused and spoke to each member of the audience and then sashayed back. <laughs> to speak to everybody else. I did feel likewise your enthusiasm was contagious <laughs> to your walking at the beginning. It fe felt a little pacey to me. You were a little, it seemed a little pacey. Another thing I really liked about your speech was how you waited to greet the audience, fellow Toastmasters, honored judges, etc., towards the end. And then you paused. And I thought that was a really effective use of pauses to make your point. Haven't we all been there and tried and failed? It was such an inspiring speech because the way you tied it back from your personal story and your personal <coughs> experience and your son's experience to how each and every one of us can keep trying despite failing. And then, of course, how you used the video at the end and we all waited. First he struck out. Then he struck out again. But then he hit the ball, and he had a home run. So it was so inspiring, and how each and every one of us can use it in our lives to inspire us to keep trying. Thank you, Chad. I really appreciate it. The audience has requested to please remain quiet to allow our judges to complete their ballots. Judges, when you are finished, please ensure your ballots are signed and raise your hand in the air. Our vote counters will come and get your ballot. Timers, please circle any contestant who did not meet the minimum time requirements or went over the time limit. When all the ballots are collected, the chief judge will announce, Mr. Toastmaster, the ballots have been collected.
Mr. Toastmaster. <clears throat> All the ballots have been collected. Wonderful. As we will excuse our ballot counter and chief Please. judge to tally up. This time I'd like to invite all the contestants up to the front. All right, so we have, we'll save our applause to the end, but to honor our participation, <coughs> In the speech contest evaluation, Andrea Weichel. Nicole Dunn. Alice Daniel. Amy Hill. And Daryl Garcia. Please give them a hand. At this point, we usually do an interview process, but I'm going to skip that just for sake of time. So please allow yourself about five minutes to do a, a bio break. We have restrooms just out this door and on the other side as well through the glass door. And when we, when we return here, I have on my clock uh, 12.06. If we can be back here by right before 12.15, 12, 12, uh, that would be great. All right. And then we'll start our speech contest. You're first. They said I'd be back at Alice. Check out your story. All right. Good luck, okay? Oh, trust me. It's just. It's funny to hear the same thing from like everybody, huh? Yeah. It's just like a like a broken record. <laughs> it's, uh, it was interesting to sit there and like after a contest where you evaluate the speech. It's a very strange Are you going to do it, Daryl? No. Uh, you did that. Uh, Sorry. 
So she is the executive sponsor of being office in California. But I have to, if we started with chair of this location, she would have been the executive sponsor. Because I like this, because we have here locally in New Mexico, we have Maybe we should see it that way, but we generally don't have a whole lot of so we have two we coordinating my contact to be able to You'll see all the ERGs that follow up on it. So that's a good point. Thanks again. We're going to kick off in two minutes. Two minutes, please. Two minutes. Thank you. 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 Do you work for Intel? Yes, I do. Very nice. It's Michael Hufford. Nice to meet you as well. Glad to see Michael Hufford. Pleasure to meet you. We're over there. Turn you on. Michael Hufford. Pleasure to meet you. Yeah, it's it's a performance evaluation. It's just it'll be brief. So thank you. Well, I found thank you. you. <laughs> that was a that I was <laughs> oh, okay, good. So I have to put wire in <laughs> Thank you. 
Right. We're missing some key individual people here. Maria, our two all right, welcome back. We got to be able to stretch a little bit. We're going to continue with our second contest, Tall Tales Speech Contest. Here are the rules. The subject of the Tall Tales speech must be highly exaggerated, improbable in nature, and have a theme or plot. Humor and props may be used to support and illustrate the speech. Speeches are three to five minutes in length. Minimum time of being two and a half minutes, maximum at five and a half minutes. The green light comes on, will be shown, complete shows, at three minutes. The yellow light card at four minutes, and the red card at five minutes, you'll have 30 seconds to wrap up. There is a one minute of silence between contestants and judges to complete their tallies. After the final contestant, the audience will be requested to please remain quiet until all judges have completed their ballots. When all the ballots are collected, the chief judge will announce, Mr. Toastmaster, all ballots have been collected. Here's the speaking order for our Tall Tale Speech Contest. First, Troy McGee. Second, Maria Moreno. Third, Alice Daniel. Sergeant in Arms, have we secured the doors? We will indeed. <laughs> Let us proceed with our first contestant. Please help me welcome Troy McGee. Speech titled The Dig. The Dig with Troy McGee. My tall tale story, The Dig, involves four university archaeologists. The first is Professor Ah. He's a stogie old head of his department, and he cares very little for Dean. Cares very little for students. The second is Mrs. Um. She is a, she is a prissy assistant to the Dean and is quite a control freak. The third is so, a handsome graduate student who's rather full of himself. And the fourth is, okay, she is an undergraduate student who is as of yet a little unsure of herself and often gets taken advantage of. Let's see how their adventure unfolds. Um, um, um. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Okay, okay. So, 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 um, 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 so. <laughs> um, 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 okay, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Um, um. <laughs> um, 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 um. Okay, okay. So, 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 so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, um, um. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Um, um, um. Okay, okay. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. So. <laughs> oh. so, so, 
Okay, okay. Kink. Kink. So. Kink. Um. Uh, uh. So. Okay, okay. Um. Um. Uh, uh, uh. So. Okay. to introduce our second speech, Maria Moreno. Oh, give us a second. Our second speech, Maria Moreno, with her speech titled, Nana's Dress. Nana's Dress, Maria Moreno. Symbols and colors that are special. 
stories about that state's history. Today, my story is going to be how Arizona got its state flag. Mr. Uh, contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, my Nana was a material woman. Oh, don't get me wrong. I mean that in the nicest way. You see, she loved fabric. She could sew before she could even read or write. Her earliest projects were mostly mending, things like sewing up her brother's elbows on, on their shirts, or making tea towels out of flour sacks. My Nana was born, she was six out of 10 children. She was born in Avondale, which is a small community at the foot of the South Mountain, just outside of Phoenix. Well, these sewing projects would always be part of her life and her family. There was always material around, her sewing kit, needles, things like that. Well, one day she got the clever idea to make herself a dress. It would be of colors that were representative of all her favorite things. She also had a very favorite pattern that she used. It was a sleeveless jumper style dress with a plain neckline buttons down the front, and princess seams. Nana was a no frills kind of person, but she loved the way princess seams looked. Well, the colors of this dress, the bottom portion would be blue, because blue was the color of her favorite dog's eyes. The top portion would be yellow and red, Red was the color of her favorite book, her Bible, and yellow was the color of her house. Nana happily wore her dress in the hot summers and in the cold, cool, mild Arizona winters. Well, one day her mother asked her to go to the store to run an errand. So Nana headed out towards the town, and while she was there, she happened to be wearing her favorite sleeveless jumper that day. She also, uh, Mrs. Hayden was also there shopping that day. Mrs. Hayden was shopping for fabric to make the Arizona state flag. When she saw Nana, she gasped, that's it, that's it. Those colors will be the inspiration for the Arizona flag. All of these colors had special meaning for the state of Arizona because the blue was reminiscent of the blue that's in our own U.S. flag. The yellow and red would symbolize the Spanish flag carried by Coronado on his journeys through the Southwest. And the final orange dot would be the Arizona copper industry. So she quickly, Mrs. Hayden quickly ran to the fabric counter. She bought all of the blue fabric. She bought the last piece from a bolt of yellow and almost all the red fabric. She said all of these colors would be very special for, this, for the flag, making this flag. She finally found a tiny bit of orange for the center star, which would represent that copper industry. Nana saw that she had bought all of this fabric except a tiny bit of red was left. So Nana thought to herself, I want that red. That's a piece of history. So she bought the red and she took it home to her mom and that's the story of how Arizona got its flag. Thank you. Mr. Timer, please allow one minute of silence.
Sergeant of Arms with the door secure. secure. Please help me welcome our third and final contestant, Alice Daniel, with her speech titled Matchmaking for Mountain Men. <laughs> Matchmaking for Mountain Men, Alice Daniel. Does anyone in the room here ski or maybe snowboard? Well, I snowboard, and I am very much looking forward to this season. It's about 91 days away, if anyone's counting. <laughs> if you've skied before, you may have heard the word snow bunny. If you haven't and you're not sure what this term means, well, it refers to the beautiful women that you find frequenting the après ski scene of the most expensive resorts in the world. You can find these women in their expensive parkas and spandex ski pants, sipping on apple teenies and hot toddies at, at the Vales and the Aspens of the world. But that's not where the term originally came from. Mr. Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, in 1915, my great-grandfather, <coughs> who was merely a boy of 13 at the time, ran away from his home in Massachusetts to the great American West. He had heard that this was a place where a boy like himself could find his fortune, fishing the fresh waters, hunting the high country, and sliding down the slopes of the first ski area in the US, Howelson Hill Ski Area. So it was there at Howelson Hill that he spent the next 10 years living and working. But eventually, as young men do, he started to want a family and a wife. And uh, unfortunately, he found there just weren't that many eligible bachelorettes in the high country of Colorado at the time. So he turned to his buddy, Bill, for advice. Bill was a ski bum. He said, Bill, what should I do? And Bill told him something that my great-grandfather almost couldn't believe. I mean, who could? Bill told him about the snow bunny. And what Bill told him about the snow bunny was that young, lonely men of the mountains, if they found this snow bunny on the snowiest night of the year was the only time it would appear to them, <laughs> they would find happiness. Now, Bill didn't know how this happened or what happened after the snow bunny appeared to these men, but he knew that all the men in the past who had gone searching for the snow bunny were now happily married men. So, one cold January night, my great-grandfather found himself on the edge of the frozen lake where the snow bunny was said to appear, with the snow coming down around him, waiting to see this snow bunny. He waited, waited, waited while the snow piled up into 30-foot drifts around him. And finally, just after midnight, he saw this bright flash of light across the lake. So strapping on his snowshoes, he started running across the lake to follow the snow bunny. It seemed to move at an astonishing speed. He could barely keep up. He went faster and faster and faster. He didn't want to lose sight of the snow bunny, his chance at happiness. Just as he thought the snow bunny was going to outpace him, something strange happened. The snow stopped. Everything. The moon danced across the snow. He looked up to look around and found himself on the top of a mountain, hundreds of miles away from where they had been a mere 10 minutes before. This mountain was so tall that it tickled the bellies of the clouds <laughs> that they stood under before it swooped down through the avalanche trenches into the valleys below. And in front of him, there was no snow bunny. There was just a beautiful woman in a white, fur-trimmed coat, reaching out to take his hand. Now, I know you might think this is too fantastic to be true, but I'm standing here in front of you, living proof of that night. And so, if you ever find yourself in the mountains on a snowy lake, on, on a frozen lake with the snow coming down around you, look around. If you're single, you might just be lucky enough to spot a real snow bunny for yourself. Thank you.
The audience is requested to please remain quiet to allow our judges to complete their ballots. Judges, when you are finished, please ensure your ballots are signed and raise your hand in the air and our vote counters will come and collect the ballots. Timers, please circle any contestants who did not meet the minimum time requirements or went over the time limit. <coughs> when all the ballots are collected, and the chief judge please announce, Mr. Toastmaster, all ballots have been collected. Postmaster, all ballots will be collected. All right, we'll excuse our chief judge and the ballot counters and invite all of our contestants for the top bells to please come up front. <coughs> Please give a round of applause for Maria Moreno and Alice Daniel. And I'm going to pick on them. We usually do interviews. And I will tell us something that is you struggle with when you prepare for the speech. One to two minutes. Oh. Alice Daniel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I struggle most when I'm trying to prepare a speech with actually finding the topic. Uh, I usually try to, to set a date for my next speech and I'll find myself weeks ahead of time not even sure what I'm going to talk about. Topics, ideas abound on the internet, none of which I'm ever sure I can quite make into a full body speech. What I tend to find myself doing is in the week beforehand, running through the list of topics, desperately researching each of them to see if I can force out an outline that would then turn into a long enough speech to actually present. I think that's my biggest struggle. Maria, why did you join Toastmasters? Thank you, Jason. I joined Toastmasters probably because I've been in it in another state and I enjoyed it. I felt it helped me 
get out of my shyness. It gave me an opportunity to be in a setting that was a, a real safe setting and a, and a helpful setting because the people that are there are usually rooting for you and they're, they want to encourage you, they want you to succeed. So they always have you know, some good, good things, to, positive things about what you're doing. And if they ha you know, when they have the, 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 the uh, critical, or not really critical, but suggestions, helpful tips, it's always done in such a nice way that it's just, it's a, it's a great environment and it just, it's, it's a real team, team spirit. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Judge, do we have our records here? Thank you. If you bear with me, I will get to the fun part. I will now turn the time over to our speech test speaker, but this is actually our VP of membership. So I'd like to call Chet Robinson to the front. And Chet, you're giving us a brief why Toastmasters is important here working at HP on a management perspective. Sure. So, so for those of you who don't know, I manage one of our commercial sales teams here in the building. And there's a couple great reasons as to why Toastmasters. So one of the things that we look for in management is because we are a sales organization, we're looking for people who can sell. We're looking for people who can sell in front of customers, people who are quick on their feet, people who know how to speak, who know how to relate topics. These are things that can be tough for anybody to practice. If you interview somebody and they're not really good at it, you kind of like, eh, there's potential there. But how do you develop that potential into skill? You don't want to do it live on the phone with customers. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bad idea, right? You only make a first impression one time. So you need an environment that's safe. So I love that Toastmasters allows us the ability to do this in a safe way, to practice to get better, no matter what stage you're at, if you're just beginning this, or if you're just, if you've been doing this for years, or anywhere in between, this is a safe place to practice. As a manager, it's valuable for me. So I actually did hire a guy from Toastmasters. I had an opening on my team, and Daryl Garcia, who you met earlier today, approached me and said, hey, I'm interested in applying for a job. And I thought, I've heard this guy speak. I like him talking to my customers. So I gave him an interview. Give me an interview with a couple other managers in the building as well. We actually ended up fighting over who got it. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with his educational background. It had nothing to do with his vocational background. It had to do with his ability to communicate. And that was absolutely honed through Toastmasters. <clears throat> That's it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'll next, I'll turn the time over to Karen Payne on the spot. How are you today? How, was How are you? Fine, fine, fine. Wonderful. I have a question for you if you don't mind coming to the front. This is our past Area 33 Governor Karen Payne. <laughs> Just brief in a minute or so, tell us how outside of what we can experience in Toastmasters, it's not necessarily about HP. So, what is a value that joining HP We Rent Toastmasters has as we can network outside of? HP within the community. Okay, so for HP employees to join HP Toastmasters in the network? So I'll make it easy. Why, <laughs> yeah. why should members join Toastmasters, or why should anyone join Toastmasters in regards to networking within the community? Oh, that's easy because I believe Chet just stole my thunder, which I didn't have in the first place. <laughs> it gives you an opportunity to be able to, to learn, to communicate with people one-on-one -on -one or in a group, and certainly to speak impromptuly, which is not a word of any of you are <laughs> We have something in Toastmasters called Table Topics, which gives you one to two minutes to respond to a random question posed by the Table Topics master, who's in a good position that night because he does not have to answer a random question. <laughs> I think that Toastmasters just basically brings out any kind of hidden qualities that you may have that you want to be able to communicate better but don't quite have the channel to do that or don't have the way to find a place where, as Chet said, you would have a supportive environment, people are pulling for you, and it's just a really tremendous opportunity. All right, thank you. 
Why did you like that? Payback's coming my way. <laughs> All right. Now, would you like to know who won? Wonderful. So, I would like to first acknowledge all of our contestants for your sacrifice, because one, we do this at work, we take time out of our day, our lunch days, and all those who are with us from other clubs. I will now introduce the evaluation winners, starting with third place. Our third place winner is Nicole Dunn. Our second place speech evaluation winner is Alice Daniel. And our first place winner is Andrea Weichel. First and second place winners move on. We're announcing first, second, and third. We are going to announce first and second place for speech contest on Tall Tales. Our second place winner today is Troy McGee. <laughs> to clean this up. <laughs> we got special permission to use this room throughout like 18 months. And if they see what we just did, we're not, we're out of here. Gonna be <laughs> and finally, our first place winner for Tall Tales is Alice Gannon. First and second place can't make it. Third will come up and we'll notify those winners if they can't make the Area 33 contest. As far as announcements, the only thing I have here is to pay attention to your program. So this following September, Saturday, September 6, 2014, is our next area contest at Savage Auditorium Presbyterian Hospital. It's the main over off Central from 1 to 5 p.m. If you're a winner, you have to be there by 12.30 for the judges' briefing. Those who win Area 33, we'll move on to Division C, which will be held September 27th at the same location, but this is the earlier session starting at 8 a.m. 8.30 with 8 a.m. is the uh, contest briefing. If you win the division, you will move on to District 23's final competition for Tall Tales and Speech Evaluation at the Hilton Garden in Amarillo, Texas. Raise your hand if you already registered for the conference. Boom. You should. You get a discount if you do it early, just so you know. I, I had a privilege of attending uh, two years for the, which one was it? Last fall. Last fall, so a year to date. Uh, uh, with, it was the it's, humorous it's speech, humorous it's speech yeah. contest. It was great. You learn mm -hmm. from many different speakers, and they're representing over 100 clubs. So it's, it's a great honor to, to meet it to that level. Chet won the district table topics our last conference, so congratulations again to you. At this time, we are officially over time, so I'd like to turn any final remarks over to our president, Alice Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Postmaster and contest chair, Jason. I have just a few final remarks. I want to thank, again, all of our <coughs> guests for being here. We know that HP is located a little far out of the way <laughs> to make it here uh, at a lunchtime during the day. So I really appreciate that we had such great attendance. I also would like to thank a few people who helped us with our contest today. Our contest judges, uh, if you would hold your applause and at the end um, applaud for these people who really helped make this contest possible. That's Harvey, Doug, Dale, there you are, <laughs> and Karen, of course. So thank you to these people who helped make the contest possible. Finally, I'd like to thank our contest chair, Jason. He stepped in and helped run this contest, plan the contest, 
as the area governor, he has a lot of other responsibilities to Toastmasters, and we really appreciate how much he steps in and still continues to help our club. So Jason, we <laughs> to do today we have several members of other clubs from our area and as they know and our club members know we went on a little bit of a, a banner rating frenzy for the last couple months and as you can see we have not just our banner today but we have three other banners today so as Toastmasters tradition since they were able to attend with club members we will be returning these banners today at the end of this program. So I'd just like to recognize the clubs that are here. If you would just stand up as I call your names, it's Rio Rancho Toastmasters. We have Midday Rio Rancho Toastmasters. And we have Taylor Ranch Toastmasters. appreciate all of you who welcomed us into your meetings, allowed us to participate in your meetings, let us steal your banners for a brief period of time, and then came to our contest. We really do appreciate the opportunity that gave us to meet you, to experience other club meetings, and to learn more from you. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. There's still some sandwiches, some chips, some sodas in the back, and I'm going to bring out some cookies if you want to grab a cookie. We'll be here for a few more minutes to wrap up our open house, you're welcome to stay and visit. Thank you all. I don't. I used to work for you. Okay. Left. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> and your name? Mark. 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 Okay. You need any help? Well, I couldn't understand the question. <laughs> 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 